Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Defiant uh, Weekly Recap. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, here we are today with our special guest, Alex Kruger. Uh, he's an economist, um, long, uh, long time crypto and macro um, uh, watcher and analyst. So, Alex, uh, so great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Kami. Thank you very much. Uh, hey guys, and uh, thank you for having me. It's, yeah, of uh, course. Um, and we also have YYC Trader, uh, our head of news, Jeremy and Owen, our staff reporters, um, and myself, uh, founder of The Defiant. So um, yeah, let's let's get down to it uh, with um, uh, talking about uh, macro uh, and crypto uh, and what you're seeing uh, coming up, Alex, uh, for this year. I think. Um, you know the the, the biggest theme uh, in in the past uh, few months, and what's driving crypto, what's driving all markets uh, is the Fed, um, and uh, and and recently for crypto, uh, the the latest headlines has been um, uh, ETFs. So why don't we start uh, with that um, and. Uh, you know, with uh, institutions lining up uh, to uh, to launch spot Bitcoin ETFs, um, BlackRock BlackRock kicked things off. Uh, so the expectation is that with this giant uh, in the room, um, maybe some one uh, Bitcoin ETF will be finally approved. Uh, what do you think uh, the chances are uh, for an approval, and uh, what? impact would that have in the market yeah of course uh the first thing i'd like to point is that uh uh it's it's interesting uh bitcoin has been trading its own doing its own thing and being quite like de decorrelated from traditional finance since uh early april mm -hmm. and uh just this week we started seeing bitcoin starting to trade in line with uh with uh equities again uh, it, it basically between today and, and and yesterday, it just started. It's, it's it's interesting to see correlation creeping back into the, up up into the market. Uh, that being said, on uh, it's uh, basically I think we have two topics. One is there the the Fed, and the other one is the SEC. Uh, on the SEC and and the ETF, um, it's interesting because uh, nothing really has changed on the ETF side. The application of BlackRock, despite of what people are saying online, the uh, the BlackRock application is identical to the Vanek application of 2018, and is identical to almost most spot applications through history. The um, the, the the presence of the information sharing agreement with the Nasdaq is nothing new. Every single spot application had it and they had it by name and they actually specified Gemini. What changed, and I do think it's a very big change, is the name. It's, it's BlackRock. Mm -hmm. And uh, BlackRock been working on BCTA for a long time. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm known, not concerned, they were actually ready to, to go and, and, and uh, apply for an ETF as of uh, late last year. This application was ready long ago. So why now? Why now? Uh, so the, uh, the the logic to me is that something happened behind the scenes, and they're talking very closely with regulators, and they're good at passing and approving ETFs, and that's what changed. We have someone. We have basically have the number one player in in the in the market saying we want to put out a bitcoin etf that that's why even though nothing has changed on the other side of the story which is basically bitcoin is prone to manipulation um and uh the sec doesn't like that and they require certain things that are maybe not there because of blackrock the um i think the odds of of the etf being approved are higher than ever which to me means higher than 50 percent exactly where I don't know. I don't think anybody can know. I think that's just guessing. Like there's not a single person uh, outside of the people actually in the in the small room behind the scenes talking about this. But that being said, even not knowing the probability, if you if you believe that the probability is at least fifty percent, that to me tells 
basically, not to me, math says that Bitcoin is not fairly valued here, it's too cheap, should be higher. Why do you think uh, a, a Bitcoin ETF approval would um, would impact the Bitcoin price uh, to go up? Uh, I think uh, I, it's it, 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 the way to think about it is like there's three stages. The first one is the run, like when, when the rumor mill starts, it's phase number one. In this case, a rumor mill started with an actual proposal. Mm -hmm. So let, we, we have rumor mill, then we have the proposal. In this case, the first one, we skipped it. Uh, once the proposal is approved, then starts the next stage into the listing. So it's kind of like three separate stages. So uh, on, on the first stage, we move up. If approved, we it should go crazy higher a lot. And then uh, once approved, the pattern in crypto is very, very clear and it repeats its tell, itself through history consistently, which is sell the news. Mm -hmm. And the reason sell the news happens is because we are uh, digents. That's the truth. We basically <laughs> were very aggressive uh, pressing the button when the news hit and we uh, and the crypto markets and the Bitcoin markets, they heat up very easily because we are so aggressive on the tape buying. So by the time the news, the, the actual news happen and we, we like the thing gets approved, everybody's already levered long and then profit taking takes place and then that, that trip stops and uh, we get a correction. That being said, uh, the, the importance, I think, of this ETF is if, so again, it's uh, proposal, approval, launch. Launch would be, uh, I think, uh, would see a profit taking and sell the news. That being said, the news, this news is so big and the actual flows behind it so large that it would make sense for profit taking, sell the news, say, say 20% and then resuming a bull trend. So it's short term, short term sell the news event and on a market top. That's that's mm -hmm. the way I'm thinking about it right now. Hey, Alex, what do you guys think? a long time follower here and uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I think you hit the nail on the head because, you know, we saw Larry Fink talking up Bitcoin right on Fox a couple of days ago. And he was like, oh, you know, it can be digital, digital gold and we want to democratize access, etc. But again, uh, like some people pointed out, his job is to get retail to buy Bitcoin, not buy it himself. Right. So even after the ETF is approved, you still need people to be coming in and buying in to the ETFs for the price to pump as we DGENs wanted to. Right? Um, this is, as you say, this is not um, what it does is it opens the floodgates. Then we need the flood. Mm -hmm. So uh, if like like the run up to the if approved, the run up into the launch is going to happen regardless. But if that happens in a very bad market, once that happens, uh, yeah, the, the flood won't come. Uh, I think by the time uh, bull market conditions are going to be there for the flood to actually happen. But it's too soon to tell where at this point we're just uh, trying to guesstimate. Right. So, so do you think this is going to break the four month cycle that we've seen roughly play out since I guess 20, 2013. Do you think we're, we're, we're exiting that, that pattern or do you think that will keep rolling? I think it's, uh, I think we will see, I think it's probabilistically it's, it's the odds of the pattern repeating itself are going down, mm -hmm. uh, simply by design It's the nature of Bitcoin and it's four years, basically the halving. So each yeah. halving is less important. Yeah. So on one hand, on on one hand, on the Bitcoin side, the the Bitcoin flows and the Bitcoin structure becomes less relevant through time. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the more retail we have and the more institutional money we have, and non crypto money, let's, regardless yeah. of its Bitcoin uh, of the nature, yeah, uh, the, the more uh, non crypto money we have, the less the less attached and prone we are to that cycle. So we have two forces going mm -hmm. in the same direction. Yeah. And another thing is uh, is uh, Retail is much more prone to uh, uh, panics and euphorias and, mm -hmm. and to uh, mm -hmm. exacerbate moves and therefore uh, make cycles uh, happen. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling element of retail. Uh, yeah. If we get the institutional player, the kind, uh, the, what we call real money, 
uh, large asset managers that they basically they just buy all the time. Yeah. Uh, those are not prone to basically what they're doing is they're playing with allocations and portfolios and uh, how much what the weight should be. They don't go to zero. So yeah. well, once we get those, they just keep on coming. So mm-hmm. it's another another factor towards the eventual disappearance, I believe, of the four year cycles. That's being said, one last thing on that topic is basically there is something important is how miners behave. Yeah. So uh, miners also make cycles happen because uh, every time there is a halving, their profitability collapses and because they run into it and they, they basically build that capacity, right. uh, then eventually they become unprofitable. And uh, so the, and, and the cycle remains because of how they become profitable and profitable and they build capacity that takes time. The, the orders and the machinery takes time to 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 get up and run up, up, up and running and, and then they collapse. It's spicy. It's it happened again. Uh, that's going to happen again yeah. on the miner side. Yeah. Interesting. So, OK, so you think that um, there's at least a 50 percent chance that uh, this BlackRock uh, Bitcoin ETF uh, gets approved. Uh, interesting that you said nothing has really changed uh, versus past uh, applications, but it's just um, the name, you know, the biggest asset manager yep. in the world. Um, and uh, there must have been something behind the scenes that we don't know that happened that made them file for this application at this point. So that's why you think that there there is a decent chance that this gets approved. And OK, what it means for for uh, Bitcoin and crypto is that we we should see a, a run up in in this um, kind of rumor mill phase of like pre-approval. And then um, if it gets approved, there's a, a short sell off. But then because of the flows that on, this on, the, on the launch, like, not yeah. on the approval, like in fact, on an approval, uh, I on, think we keep oh, on right. running. Yes, that's right. On, on the approval, it's that's confirmed so like a a rally and then on the launch of that uh, there's a bit of a sell-off but then um the real money that should come in from institutions from retail is such that uh, that sell-off would be short-lived and then we 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 would have a continued um you know just yeah uh, now now on a a bit of a sell-off could can be very violent Hmm. (laughs) it's it's bitcoin right so yeah uh, just uh it's the nature of the game uh, by the time everybody here is in a mainstream media let's put it this way if you're playing altcoins by the time you hear it on twitter you're too late hmm. the narrative already took place people is already positioned bitcoin is slower because it's bigger so by definition something that is bigger it takes more force to move so it's not by the time it's on twitter it's done it's by the time it's on mainstream media is done Mm, it's it's right. uh, it's a bit of a hyperbole. I'm simplifying because, of course, uh, mainstream media is already talking about it, but it's not yet everywhere. And and I don't know about you guys, but I can tell you, and I I, I, I w- we talked about this with a lot of people and polled it, like how many of us uh, crypto natives have been asked about Bitcoin by uh, our non crypto friends, and uh, in the last few weeks since the BlackRock news, and the answer has been uh, very consistently zero. Mm. I don't know what yeah. you, what do you uh, have you yeah. have you perceived uh yeah no I, I don't I don't think the the um Bitcoin ETF news has reached kind of mainstream yet uh yeah I haven't like anecdotally I haven't had any friends like non-crypto friends ask me about it either oh yeah absolutely it's it's yeah. still all about the tech stocks Tesla and stuff like that even from people like my normie friends who are Active investors don't want to touch crypto yet because, I mean, the number's not high enough for them, I guess. They'll buy in yeah. above 50K like they did last cycle, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I don't Maybe we're jumping too soon to this, but Alex, like, how do you, you know, we're talking about Bitcoin. Do you, how do you see the layer ones and kind of the trickle down of the higher risk, higher return assets playing into bitcoins anticipated market moves i mean there are a lot of dependencies there but maybe high level thoughts would be interesting to people listening i think uh most layer ones are dead 
and mm -hmm. uh, they won't have a chance uh, with uh, big money, but uh, uh, crypto hot money and basically what we uh, joke uh, as the rotators will keep on playing the narratives and the rotations. But mm -hmm. that being said, most layer ones have no future uh, yeah. with, uh, with the Ethereum layer twos. Uh, that's what we need. I think Solana mm -hmm. is not going to die. I think it's the one layer one aside of Ethereum and of course Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin has no smart contracts somewhat, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, that's the way I see it. We have Bitcoin. I think uh, uh, there is a chance of uh, layer two some Bitcoin uh, uh, driving uh, heavy traffic. It's not yet happening for now. It's just us playing yeah. rotations and narratives. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, ETH, Arbitrum, Optimism. That's real. I think Coinbase's uh, base is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. uh, that's optimism, optimism based. Yeah. And uh, and again, on layer ones, I think they're mostly dead. And I don't think they're going to come back uh, yeah. outside of Solana. Yeah. Uh, and I'm and, and sorry, and Polygon. But Polygon has this thing, which is uh, they are not really part of crypto. Uh, all of these... Um, partnerships and all these new people and all these companies and the communities they bring in, they're not crypto and they don't interact with crypto. So like, for example, the Reddit NFTs and, and things like that, that money doesn't yeah. flow into crypto. It just stays there. They use Polygon. It drives activity, but that money doesn't flow into Polygon. So there is no uh, multiplicative uh, effect on basically liquidity flowing back and forth and and making making froth pop up it's it's separate mm -hmm. so even though i think polygon is going to remain all this new flow they bring is not really part of the crypto ecosystem to put it in a way ironically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and with their 2.0 roadmap i mean they're pivoting more away from being their own l1 and trying to be a zk powered you know uh, offshoot of ethereum i guess so they've yeah i guess they kind of realized that you know going your independent l1 route is really hard especially through the bear market so they um i mean they always had plans to kind of they position themselves as what a side chain of ethereum so now they're i guess they're going to be uh, i don't know what they're calling themselves zk validium is what the um, pos chain is going to become but what what it eventually turns out to be i mean who knows yeah yeah we have a, a question here from um our our uh, listeners uh, and I encourage everyone listening to drop uh, their, their questions here in the comments but um claudio is asking what less known crypto has the potential to be in the top 10 altcoin in the next bull run hmm. why do you want to know claudio <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to to be honest, I'm not positioned on anything that I feel like uh, uh, I don't have any backs to shill. I'm almost entirely on uh, Bitcoin and ETH right now. So uh, maybe ask me in a month. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, feel then shill. I don't have it. I'm 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 very focused on just uh, uh, the bigger picture and. Uh, been been uh, any any altcoin plays that I've been doing they're short term uh short term in the sense of basically 10 15 percent moves up to 40 percent this takes uh, uh hours to days to a couple of weeks and then out entirely out there are mm -hmm. trades they're not positions Got it. and then um okay speaking about watching the the, the, the long term um and the bigger picture uh, let's shift uh, to to macro uh, and what you're seeing um, with the Fed and inflation um, and uh, rates. So where do you think we are uh, with inflation uh, and in, in that sense uh, with rates coming up? I mean, have we um, have we reached uh, a peak? Are we starting to I mean, are, are you seeing uh, data show that uh, Inflation is, is finally, you know, starting to uh, soften from here. Um, and uh, will will the Fed, uh, you know, uh, well, um, react? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, it, let, let's put it this way. Uh, for the Fed to react is we need to see uh, a surprise. Uh, inflation is coming down, but it's not coming. And it's coming down extraordinarily. 
but it's doing so based on base effects. So the perception for the casual reader is like this is, is working out, but it doesn't have a major effect, a major effect on markets because it's basically, we joke about it, but it's true, it's priced in. It's, mm -hmm. it's basically, it's an expectation of, of, uh, of inflation coming down and uh, it's uh, happening. It's not happening as fast as we and the Fed would like to see. Uh, let's put what we think and what we try to predict aside for a while and, and focus on the fact, a couple of facts. Uh, the first one is almost nobody, if, if anybody, has been able to predict inflation uh, uh, accurately. Even the ones that were right at the beginning, they were wrong after. So mm -hmm. what does that tell you? That there was a bias effect there. It's not that good forecasters. They were just biased towards higher inflation. It's very hard to predict inflation beyond the next print. The next print, the next two prints, you can. If you go further on in time, you get into futurology. It's very hard for those models to be accurate. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that being said, uh, I think the way to approach it is just just believe the Fed. Let's try to not, not second guess these guys. What are they saying? True, they were widely wrong until the beginning of 2022. But they, they, they haven't been wronged since. They've been actually delivering on what they've been saying. So uh, uh, being a little bit more explicit, the last FOMC gave us some very good information. It gave us what you can call the Fed's reaction function, something we, the market, didn't have before. Uh, what we saw basically is that core CPI projections for year end of this for, for the, the Fed's core CPIs, so core PC, which is a proxy for CPI, which is what they look at, uh, for year end, that, that forecast of theirs went up by 0.3% or, or 0.3 percentage points, not 0.3%. And in response to that, they added two extra hikes into their forecasts by year end. So the way to think about it is the Fed just disclosed for the first time in a long time their inflation reaction function and made it public mm -hmm. to us. 0.3% on, on core equals two hikes. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, inflation is coming down and uh, yeah, it's, it's coming down. It's it's right now the Fed for year end on the core side. They're looking at 3.9% uh, a few weeks ago. And, and a month ago, they were looking at 3.6%. Uh, the, the, the reason for the change is that basically they're not as bearish on the economy. Uh, unemployment has been not trending up as fast as they expected. Uh, the economy, actually, the U.S. economy, not not the China economy, not the European economy. The U.S. economy has been uh, rather strong at beating forecasts. It's doing well. It's yeah. It's likely there is a there's say uh, there's decent lots of a recession coming up uh, at the end of this year, early next year. Uh, but uh, it's likely small. The economy is strong, and on that, I do want to stress another thing is. Even in a recession, we, it's not enough to have a recession for everything to collapse. We need things to get really bad. And, and another interesting data point that people tend to not be aware of uh, because of an uh, um, justified extraordinary focus on U.S. markets, mm -hmm. uh, equity markets can make new all-time highs, and they do, even during recessions. So this perception that a recession implies that everything must crash and we must see new lows is uh, historically incorrect. Um, uh, France saw all-time highs in March. Mm. Uh, Germany saw all-time highs in May. Uh, mm. Japan not because they were, uh, you know, they had their all-time highs in, in 1990 or 91 or 89. Uh, but... Uh, They've been they've been seeing like decade highs again uh, in the last uh, few couple of weeks. Um, uh, that pretty much. In terms of that like recession that you're speaking of, those are there certain sectors um, or, or or regions that that you see outperforming others? Uh, 
And and are we talking about this on a, like a global scale versus just the United States? Or are we talking about? Uh, yeah, on on uh, sector wise, we have is two two very clear uh, uh, a clear winner and a clear loser. Uh, the winner is tech. Uh, anything that is tech uh, uh, related, uh, uh, both on the on the SaaS cloud and uh, 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 chip manufacturing and, and basically capacity bottlenecks, that um, that's that should outperform on the underperforming, which which is very like the source of a very very major risk uh, in the U.S. economy is commercial real estate. Uh, the issue with commercial real estates is they tend to have a uh, uh, use uh, shorter term financing and uh, with uh, uh, short term rates as high as they are. Basically, this this sector uh, economic activity on that sector has it's on a standstill and uh, we could still start seeing a lot of blow ups there, which translate into regional banks weakness. So. If that happens, which may very well happen, and I think uh, it, the question is, the question is not if it's going to happen or not. It's like how big is it going to be? I don't have a good answer at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the way to think about it is that will be a replay of March uh, of this year. And uh, worldwide, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so just to clarify, you you do see um, more more weakness in in regional banks in the U.S. Uh, because of uh, rates, because of higher yields. Yeah, because of the commercial real estate industry, mm. Mm. Okay, uh, yes. mainly. Okay. Um, okay. Now go go ahead. Didn't mean to to interrupt. Uh, on uh, it's it's just just briefly. Uh, mm -hmm. the Europe Europe is not doing well. Uh, Europe is the the opposite of the U.S. There's two things. Uh, in the U.S., we've seen economic activity beating expectations consistently or all year. In Europe, in the last month, is the exact opposite. Uh, economic activity is is coming uh, weak versus the expectations first. Second, recession is a reality and inflation is uh, actually, uh, it's, it's hotter than the US uh, right now. Yeah, Europe is pretty, uh, is, is not in good shape, Europe, uh, mm. which, uh, which can, can uh, well, let's leave that for later, the dollar. Uh, on, on China, um, uh, China is slowing down uh, considerably. Uh, the, the reopening happened and happened very fast. China went from basically being a, a ghost town to, to being at peak pre-COVID activity in a matter of a couple of months. Mm. Uh, however, the economy is not that strong, so they're talking about uh, implementing a fiscal and monetary stimulus again. Uh, the market, I think, is getting a little bit over too overexcited there because the numbers they're talking, they're not that big. Uh, so what we have basically is we have a strong U.S. economy or a relatively stronger U.S. economy, weak Europe, and uh, Europe there's not much Europe can do to fix that weakness, and a weak China, but China does have the tools to to basically stabilize that, and those tools are good for markets. They, they br basically bring liquidity. Gotcha. Uh, if they're if there is no recession like what you're talking about how does bitcoin fit into that picture and and the broader crypto uh, the broader crypto sector as well or DeFi? well i think for DeFi and the broader crypto sector we need retail back that's the issue uh we have we have a bitcoin market right now and then then we also have an eth market because if there's a bitcoin etf there's going to be an eth etf eventually so there's a lag there but uh, that that money and uh, and actually that's what U.S. regulators have been trying to do. If you if we think about it, is they're trying to they're trying to make it about Bitcoin and not crypto. They don't like crypto. They don't like people uh, trading on blockchains. They like to be able to track absolutely everything we do uh, on their systems and and being able to basically control transfers and sensor transfers, which on the blockchain they can do. They don't like the fact that anybody can go on Uniswap or PancakeSwap or whatever the swap and just launch whatever good coin or shit coin or whatever. It's not the point, it's they don't like that. Like uh, Mika regulations to Europe right now, they're trying to, they want to uh, forbid people from actually launching coins on DEXs. Yeah. You, you, you're gonna have to register, but 
yeah, legally they want you to register, but people will be still be able to go and say, excuse my French, fuck off. I'm doing it anyway. Um, so uh, uh, back to the US, they don't like that. So it's this push towards uh, Bitcoin, right? And, um, and, and that's happening. That's, I think uh, it's, it's going to attract even more and more money. But for that money to flow into DeFi, the old DeFi, the DeFi we knew from uh, DeFi summer in 2021, we need a uh, retail euphoria or some retail good vibes to, I can't find a better word to, 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 to come back. Uh, we, we are not there yet. Uh, yeah. this, this, this other big push on DeFi, which for RWAs, which uh, are real world assets, as you know, which is kind of funny because RWA, uh, it's a very old word in, in uh, old, like 15 year old word, uh, word in, uh, in traditional finance. It means risk weighted asset. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we've appropriated the RW, RWAs, but there's a lot of RWA platforms, as you sure you, you know more than myself on, on this uh, topic. There's so many of them coming up and they're very good products and I think they're going to work, but they're not targeted to uh, crypto degens. They're targeted to, to, to a different world, to a different kind of investor. Yeah. I mean, most of these real world protocols require accredited status anyway, right? So that eliminates most degens right off the bat. Um, KYC. Yeah. yeah. KYC plus. I mean, even the asset level, even if uh, if you've survived the bear market, it eliminates a lot of uh, your casual investors for sure. Uh, you mentioned the dollar. <clears throat> I'd be really curious to hear your outlook for the dollar, you know, because uh, we have this kind of uh, imbalance where, you know, the Fed's been tightening. So, yes, the dollar has been strengthening like crazy. Obviously, last year we saw the, the blow off top around 113 on the DXY. But historically speaking, it like the DXY from at least my 15, 18 years of watching it doesn't tend to stay above 100 for a long time. It's like outside its comfort zone. So uh, what's your outlook medium term for the UST in terms of uh, uh, for, first short term? These payrolls numbers today were are very were uh, uh, dollar bearish. So uh, it, it makes sense for it was very, very, very weak numbers and uh, Basically, we uh, we changed the trend on payrolls uh, being hot. Is that which has been running for quite a while? So, I think uh, short term, uh, next uh, week or two, the dollar should 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 stay uh, weak. Uh, it's I wouldn't say this trend. That's short term. Uh, beyond that, uh, bigger picture, um, we have this. So three things: short term, mid term, long term. That's the short term. The mid term, uh, meaning the next couple of months, uh, it's uh, trickier because on one side. Uh, China weakness plus the Fed basically the Fed the Fed has been actually hawkish. Uh, the Fed basically just gave us uh, two extra hikes. The market said that we're okay with that. It's in fact it's interesting. It's the, the thing is the market eliminated fully uh, rate cuts in in this year. Uh, in in uh, and like early this year we had two rate cuts. At up to May the market had rate cuts priced in. So the concern was. The market is wrong. Those rate cuts need to be gone. Therefore, that's going to make the market crash. Well, the market did away with the rate cuts. The market didn't crash. So we eliminated a very major uh, wall of worry. We went, stepped over it. That's that's behind us. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, the market is not getting it wrong on on the on the cut side on 2023. On 2020, I'm, I'm moving on to the, I changed topics, went on to rates. So uh, back to the dollar, the point is uh, we have uh, on, on like beyond the immediate term, we have on one hand, we have a strong Fed, uh, a strong a hawkish Fed that basically should make the dollar sustain itself. On the other hand, we have a very weak China uh, uh, sending, uh, basically also helping the dollar go up and um I, it, to me, it makes sense for the dollar to stay around this level, so go a little bit uh, or, or, or strengthen a little bit. Uh, that being said, I, I do want to stress here two things. The first is I don't have a strong edge on the dollar beyond the short term. I would, I'm not trading this right now because I'm, I'm focused on, on, on tech. I'm, I'm focused on crypto. I'm not focused on trading. I'm not, not trading gold anymore. 
which is something I used to trade very actively, I don't have positions there. Uh, if I would be, I would be doing, I would be right now long gold. Um, but uh, the, on the dollar, it's, it's, I, I don't think it, that it matters that much. Hmm. That, that's yes. what I want to say. I think the market is, is focused a little bit too much on the dollar. Uh, it's just because it's simpler to think and understand. Uh, it should be focused more on, on rates which is what drives the dollar and central banks and all the multiple variables behind it than the dollar itself. And, and one last thing on the dollar, the DXY is basically 60, what is it, 63, I forgot the exact, the exact percentage. Yeah, it's, all it's about 63% Euro dollar. So <laughs> we're talking Euro. So uh, yeah, it's Europe is not doing well. Um, I, I have a I have a hard time reading what the ECB is is doing right now, and there's something very simple for me: when something doesn't move the market, I the market is so complex and there are so many variables that if I look at everything, I go crazy. So if something is not moving the market, I ignore it. So the ECB right now to me doesn't matter that much. Mm. I'm ignoring it, uh, which means that I'm not paying much attention to the dollar either because the dollar is mainly driven by euro dollar. Interesting. Uh, if you think that rates is what uh, matters and um, the, the market uh, is, is not pressing in cuts uh, anymore this year, um, where do you see uh, rates going for you know the rest of uh, 2023 and, and next year? Um, the, the curve right now, the yield curve of the US, it's inverted to an extraordinary level. And uh, that should normalize. So mm -hmm. the, the play there is basically what is what uh, in rates world is called uh, steepeners. Uh, the, the, the curve, like the long end needs to come back up. Uh, I, I think on the short end, basically, right now we are eventually, not this year, but they're like late this year, or early next year, start coming down as the long end goes up. Uh, one thing important there is, is why is the curve inverted? Um, the curve is inverted mainly for because of two things, and it's not really about predicting uh, recessions. It's mainly on one hand is it's basically it's about flows, supply and demand. Mm -hmm. So on the short end, we have the Fed keeping the short end, sending the short end. By, by the short end, I mean uh, interest rates uh, on the one-year tenor or mm -hmm. up to two years, right? Uh, that's the short end. What say say so? What is uh, treasury bills? Mm -hmm. um, the Fed is keeping the short end high and sent it up in the strongest and most aggressive hiking cycle in history. Therefore, it is natural for the curve to invert. The curve inversion is not the cause of the recession. It's just another consequence of the Fed getting so aggressive. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's, it goes, it, it, it's not a leading indicator really of recession, but it's something that happens a little bit before, but driven by the same thing with a lag. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, other, the other point there is on the long end, uh, why, why are rates so low? Uh, the predominant view is that basically the market is predicting uh, slow growth and a recession. And therefore that's why when there's a recession in economic activity, goes down, which basically makes interest rates go down. So that's that's why people are looking at long rates, why the market, why people think low rates are low. There's another thing that very few people talk about, but uh, in, in on the public sphere, but is known on the on the institutional side, which is basically there is imagine uh, a gasoline, uh, there's a massive dinosaur that just has endless demand for eating bonds. They have all this money and they need to put it to play and they buy long bonds. So uh, it, it, that, that, that is the demand for long bonds pushes prices of long bonds up and uh, rates are the inverse mathematically of prices. So pushes rates down. So on one hand, on the, on the short end, we have the Fed pushing rates higher and on the long end, we have, say, half recession fears or slower economic activity fears. 
and health just real demand for for those assets Wait, so where's that, that, that demand coming the from pension the demand. oh got it okay yeah Mm. Yeah, and is demand increasing uh, in general for uh, yeah, I, I would get for for uh, treasuries, right? Because rates are it's, higher. It's steady. It's they have the money. They need to they need to deploy it. And other markets outside of the U.S., their bond markets are too small. Mm. So, so yeah, it's yeah. Go ahead. So rates will. Uh, uh, sorry, the the curve uh, will. Um, will revert i mean right now it's uh, we're, we're seeing short-term rates higher than long-term rates you're saying that this should uh, come back to normal quote unquote like lower uh, shorter yeah. rates and, and higher longer rates um and so how does that impact crypto um uh, low rates are good for risk taking especially for hot money uh, hot money is a term uh, used in the hedge fund world for basically say you are um, you want to invest in uh, in uh, high high yielding risky assets and you go into emerging markets and you're a hedge fund and you go and you buy Argentina bonds but you get in and out in and out hot money and basically you pump and dump it mm -hmm. uh, we crypto in a way crypto players are very similar to to EM uh, hedge fund traders, we are mostly hot money. We get in and out very aggressively, uh, and for doing those plays, we need uh, we need cheap cheap finding cheap financing. Uh, that's why uh, short rates. Uh, that's why crypto in in general it's it's uh, it'd be very helpful for interest rates to go down for crypto to go up. I think that's basically what's going to drive eventually people to flow into crypto, besides Bitcoin and, and ETH, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's going to be slow. That's the thing. It's This is not a... Um, I mean, I'm guessing here, but I think this is not a... This is not... It, it, the people saying that inflation is sticky, they're, they're right. Inflation mm. is sticky. It's not... Yeah, it's coming down aggressively, but not that fast. And uh, mm. it may happen that basically it stay, and I think it's going to happen that it's going to drop and then it's going to stabilize. And then years later, it keeps on going down. So sticky mm -hmm. inflation and higher rates make sense to me. I think we're going back down to a world uh, uh, at some point in, say, late 2024 uh, and, and 25, and we're going to be there in this like new new uh, world in between of rates in the three percent. Uh, we're not going back to zero. We're going at two three percent. We're going in between. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's good. It's not great, but it's, it's 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 better than what we have right now. I think we see the stickiness in our like everyday lives, right? Uh, whenever a business raises prices for something, whether it's a restaurant, grocery store, or whatnot, you never see those prices go down after that. Like, inflation numbers might change. Like, we had, we went from 9% to 4%, but my Chinese takeout guy hasn't dropped his prices. Mm -hmm. Right? So, right. it's, I think it takes a long time, like Alex says, uh, for yeah. this effect to actually trickle down into the economy. Hmm. Uh, what, one thing there is, that's, we shouldn't expect in, uh, prices to go down. We just want them to stop going up. Mm. Yeah. Um, we don't. We don't really want deflation. We we want uh, we uh, anybody who has money in the market, the Fed, most of us. We want very low, steady inflation. Uh, if we start to see prices being cut on on the retail side, and uh, uh, and and same say housing. If if uh, house prices start going down a lot, we have a very big problem because then then people they they can't uh, uh, refinance uh, their mortgages and uh, that's that's how basically two thousand eight happened, right? Hmm. So I, I think in general, what I'm getting uh, from from your outlook, Alex, is, is um, th there are different reasons to be bullish uh, long term. Uh, right, we we have um, this uh, rate uh, outlook with uh, lower, shorter term uh, rates, um, though not not at zero, but uh, lower than than we are today. Um, you don't see a huge uh, risk of of a recession. Um, you see a, a decent chance of a Bitcoin ETF getting approved. Uh, this all coupled with a Bitcoin having in, in the next year, 
Um, so in general, it looks like you do have a, a somewhat bullish outlook on, on crypto yeah, the, and, and risk assets, yeah. no? The, the thing that makes me the most bullish is positioning of long-term uh, money. Hmm. Um, it's positioning like uh, I see it on, on I see it on talking to people and I see it on uh, I see it on the data I see it on on various positioning metrics uh, uh, let's put it this way uh, separate uh, uh, shorter term money and longer term money short term risk assets are now overheated mm. uh, you can look at the metrics on derivatives on options on futures uh, and uh, the sh short term equities are hot right now like i wouldn't be buying here uh i wouldn't be selling i would be uh waiting to deploy more on dips mm. but more importantly is i'm not concerned about it why because longer term money is at historically high cash levels and the interest rates are going to start coming down, which means those cash levels are going to start flowing from cash into risk assets, mm -hmm. which include equities. And uh, once correlations come back up, which they, they, they just started creeping up again, as I said at the beginning, but longer term, uh, again, if a BlackRock ETF or a ETF, a spot ETF is approved, we're going to have a whole uh, new plethora of market makers and uh, new market participants are still, they're going to start reinforcing correlations between crypto and traditional assets. So uh, even though right now it doesn't matter as much what traditional finance is doing and what equities are doing uh, in six months, uh, it's likely going to, probabilistically, I think, is going to matter. Hmm. Uh, so uh, the point there is, uh, yeah, it's the economy is not great. Uh, I think uh, a recession will likely happen. I think it's going to be a small recession. And uh, I think that's uh, mostly priced in. And uh, there's no reason to expect a massive crash. Um, so I'm constructive. I'm, I'm optimistic. That that's I'm going back to my old self of basically being optimistic and focusing on the trend. And yes, there will be dips, and those dips are where people who have so much money on the sidelines, they want to deploy it. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Do you have any any price targets for Bitcoin and ETH? Uh, I don't know for year end for next yeah. year. N not for ETH. I have uh, I have uh, targets for Bitcoin. I, I usually uh, I trade them together, and uh, I tend to it's. Some people may find this uh, funny, but even even if I'm trading ETH, my focus is on on Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, on the Bitcoin chart, uh, okay. uh, Bitcoin levels, you have basically 34K, 35K as like your first uh, take profit point. Then you have 37K. 37K is the Luna breakdown level, okay. uh, literally where in, in uh, like May 10th or 11th from where we broke down that weekend, mm -hmm. that was 37K. So uh, there is basically what is called an air pocket between the highs and 37K. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next level is 42K. Uh, on there, it's there's something that is very common is people tends to put short-term traders tend to put stops on the round numbers. And uh, yeah. short-term traders are there to be taken advantage of. <laughs> so they put their stops in the round numbers, you run them over, you take their money. So... Uh, that's why usually like 20K, if you go to 20K and a half, 20K is going to get run over probabilistically. And we, you, go, you, you should expect to go down to 19.7, 19.5. The same when you trade against 30, expect 30 to be broken. Like first, if it, this is basically, we change topic, now it's price action. If price is running from, from down below, you hit uh, 30k on a 20% move. Expect it to resist on the first resist on, on the first touch, then back down, little correction, back up, run it over. Um, that's the way I look at prices. That's the way I uh, trade short term around positions, uh, and uh, based on that, uh, is that I think that if I have to guess right now what's going to happen. 40 is not a level 40 is the level that you run over uh so if we go above 37 we go to 42 nice. beyond 40 why 42 42 was the china level from uh, may 21 uh, we traded it many times 
is kind of imprinted in in the brains of uh, risk takers. Hmm. Um, Interesting. So yeah, 34, 35, 37, 42, and then who knows? Got it. Fair enough. That's super interesting. Um, do you guys have any any more questions for Alex? We've uh, we've used up uh, the entire hour, <laughs> but uh, rightly so. Um, super interesting discussion. Uh, yeah, I mean, so. it's been great having a trader yeah. on the show. Yes, uh, you know, <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah, I have to say. Uh I, I guess I got I have one and and I'm you know running around writing daily articles about crypto um, and then I see people talking about the Fed plumbing changing especially since March and the beginning of maybe what is a continuous banking crisis so like are, are there big changes in the way the Fed is operating I know there's like BTFP are, are are you watching kind of some of that semi granular monetary plumbing the way the fed moves yeah. money around yeah like there was a change but there was yeah. not basically the and, and they're trying to pretend that nothing changed but something right. changed right which is the following uh, uh, uh historically uh any banking problems would be addressed with monetary policy right and now they've separated rates are for monetary policy and uh, other direct measures of injecting liquidity are for addressing credit issues and banking problems. They so right. they separated that, and the reason they did that is to try to ensure that the market, if the market starts worrying about banks collapsing, yeah. that they don't price too many Fed cuts. They're saying, "Hey guys, we're not going to cut rates. We're going to address that differently." Right. Uh, they started talking about this for the first time in October last year. And uh, in March, with the banking crisis, it became prevalent, and they mm -hmm. actually implemented the changes and uh, the, the new uh, uh, the new uh, uh, B, uh, BTP facility. Yeah. Uh, but um, it, it, it's it's basically that, and they've been very very consistent and very repetitive on that message mm -hmm. that any banking problems are not going to be addressed with rates. Rates are for inflation. That's the change. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, I think uh, we we should wrap up. We have like seven minutes left for all the other headlines. <laughs> so, um, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Uh, really great to have your outlook on, on crypto and macro. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Ciao, ciao. ciao. Bye. Thank you. All right, that was interesting. Um, yeah, uh, good to see some uh, bullish commentary. Uh, it, it feels like, you know, um, optimism is coming back in the market. What did you guys think? Yeah, optimism is more than just a, a layer, <laughs> another layer on the Ethereum. Oh, right, <laughs> not, not just another layer too. <laughs> Um, okay. Um, yeah, let's let's uh, run through uh, the other headlines that we had um, this week. Um, let's see. Uh, maybe we can just round up uh, our markets talk. Uh, we had, um, you know, the um, quarter two uh, wrap up uh, in June. Um, and and crypto did uh, did really well. Uh, YYC, do you want to talk markets? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've all enjoyed the first half of uh, the year, I think, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to markets. And uh, like Alex was just uh, talking about, the correlation between uh, stocks and crypto kind of broke down uh, towards the end of uh, end of last year, I'd say. Uh, before that, for almost all of 2022, we were trading almost in lockstep with the Nasdaq. And I think uh, one reason for the divergence was all the uh, uh, regulation, uh, the SEC's actions and, you know, uh, grayscale issues towards the end of the year. There were, there were a lot of crypto-specific drivers that might have uh, caused that correlation to break down. But now we're seeing it pick back up. You know, the NASDAQ, S&P, everything has kind of reclaimed most of its 2022 losses. And so has crypto, almost. I mean, uh, 
disregarding the first quarter of 2022, which was like peak bull. But um, the fact that we're trading at 30K and, uh, you know, almost 1900 on ETH is uh, in the face of the Fed rate at 5%, I think is remarkable and shows, uh, you know, remarkable resi resilience uh, on the part of crypto as an asset class. And yes, coming to the story, of course, uh, yes, we outperformed uh, stocks and commodities and pretty much, I think, were the best performing asset class. And you'd expect that, right? Because uh, crypto as a whole is a high beta uh, kind of multiplied risk asset. So when uh, the majority of risk goes up, crypto goes up more. Um, mm -hmm. And we had... Uh, um, going forward for the rest of the year, we'll have to see whether that... Uh, that keeps up. Um, I think Alex covered most of the stuff that we uh, uh, covered in this article about, you know, the halving coming up in April. Mm -hmm. That's kind of driving the Bitcoin narrative. So um, Bitcoin dominance, of course, has been on on the rise. Uh, it stopped 50% uh, 50 for the first time in two years. Uh, and we're seeing that with the most altcoins just decimated, even though Bitcoin has been holding up remarkably well. Uh, even over the last week when we had a bit of a sell-off in ETH and stuff, Bitcoin was still kind of holding its ground. Mm. And uh, in terms of DeFi, we have the LST narrative is firmly in control. Uh, liquid staking protocols have just exploded in TVL after uh, Ethereum Shanghai upgrade, which oh. enabled withdrawals for the first time. So first we saw money flow into the direct liquid staking protocols like Lido, Rocket Pool, etc. Now we're seeing other projects building on top of these liquid staking tokens. So mm -hmm. this has given rise to the name LSTFI. Um, so Pendle is one that's been a great, a huge beneficiary over the last uh, couple of months uh, mm -hmm. because it allows you to basically split your yield bearing asset into the principal and the yield and trade those separately. So I think one a reason why a lot of people are, but maybe this is just a theory, uh, my theory, I guess, uh, a reason why a lot of people are piling into Pendle and like locking in the fixed yield on their staked ETH is because there is, there's, the queue is so full and there's so much ETH waiting to enter the staking queue, which would, uh, you know, intuitively dilute the rewards and cause the yield to go down at your staking yield on ETH. Meaning, all else being equal, you'd expect with more ETH staked, APY goes down. Mm. Right? So that could be a reason why, you know, people are saying, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm already in the stake. Uh, you know, I have uh, my my tokens. I can just uh, lock in the yield right now. Makes sense. Oh, do you want to add to that? You wrote the, the story on Pendle. Yeah. I mean, what I see said most of the you know he said it better than i i did in many ways um but yeah so so basically just tacking onto that pendle splits yield um so you so you can basically strip a bond so you have the principal and the yield trading separately um and they have attracted 125 million in total value locked. And a lot of that has come, there are a couple of jumps in terms of how it got there. One, they released a V2 in November, which allowed for uh, improvements in capital efficiency. I think they figured out that they can, there's an AMM component and they where you can stake your, uh, it's pretty complicated, but you can stake your stripped assets, which has the bond and yield component. And they figured out that the yield is not going to fluctuate as much as a normal price, kind of in the same way curve, uh, create their bonding curves are made. So you, they're custom made for stable coins. So they know they're not going to like go up to $5 or whatever. So I think they were able to figure out some capital efficiency there. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, they, I mean, they've, I don't know what else to say. I guess they've they've been they've been successful in terms of um, not only LST Phi but other yield bearing assets. They've ridden the wave of GMX, which has a yield bearing GLP yeah, token. Yeah, talk about on. the Pendle Wars a little bit. I think that's interesting, right? Okay, yeah, that's maybe the part you didn't hit. Um, so yeah, and basically, so they have components. They have an AMM. They have yield splitting, and then they also have 
a Pendle token, which you can lock in the same way you can lock up Curve. You get VE Pendle, which gives you access to fees generated through the platform. And in the same way that Convex emerged uh, to give people instant liquidity on their locked up Curve, now there are a couple protocols competing to attract people to, to give them their pendle. So they, mm -hmm. so those protocols lock them up and they can get paid as other projects incentivize them. So right now it's like neck and neck. There's one called PenPy and one called Equilibria, and they both have roughly 25% of the total pendle, which um, has been on an absolute tear in the past week um or the past i guess i guess since january it's it's a uh, it's kind of a huge amount if you look at the article um so that's that's where it stands and you know we've seen a lot of people starting to play with yield in DeFi. we saw vaults also um integrating the ability to trade yield so i mean on a super high level i think people are DeFi is becoming more sophisticated people are starting to learn how to trade yield or People are trying to, some projects are trying to teach people how to trade yield. So, yeah, that's where that stands. I mean, this is a huge concept in traditional finance. Like, yield yeah. stripping is one, of, like, this is how you create asset backed securities or any, any kind of security, right? You take a bond or a mortgage or whatever and you slice and dice it into different pieces that different investors want, right? right. Some are conservative, they just want to lock in their yield. Okay, so they keep the principal, sell off the yield to someone else. Right. Someone else thinks, oh, you know what? I can make more money speculating on the yield component itself. Mm -hmm. And now I don't need to buy a whole stake deep to get that yield. Right. I can just buy the yield token. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I put up less capital and I can speculate. So it gives you so many. Um, it opens up a lot of new strategies, especially if we see institutions come in, like with yeah. BlackRock. And, you know, if, if all that gets approved, you'd see a lot more utilization of these uh, interest rate swap protocols uh, i think yeah he i did i talked to the the guy at pendle he did give one piece of information which was interesting which was that they like they did deploy a pop-up if people were pushing through a transaction worth over i think it was like two hundred fifty thousand. so they're 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 specifically trying to find out who those bigger players are and they i think they like reach out to them or give them an email or something so they're they're definitely trying to they're splitting their efforts into retail education, but also trying to nab those bigger players and figure out what they need. Interesting. So, yeah. So right now, the reason why people would buy the uh, yield piece of um, of like the the token is because they think that it's cheap. So they're they're betting that uh, yields on state ETH should increase over time, or is it also maybe people are, people are buying these tokens because they want to lend them to short or both? Like what's... Um, as of now, I don't think uh, you uh, there's a lending protocol that supports the yield tokens yet. Mm -hmm. So the use case for someone buying it would be yes, to speculate that the yields would go up, which would then drive up the price of this token more yeah. so than it would for your staked ETH directly, right? Or wrapped yeah. staked ETH or whichever one you're holding. That, that's some, that would be an interesting like metric to watch, like how, how these tokens are moving and it, it'll, it, it can give you a gauge on what people are thinking. Like, do people think that yield on stake teeth will, will rise or not? Like, I don't, I don't see a, a reason why it, it would rise. Like the trend has been for, for more um, people. I mean, for, for ETH, stake ETH to increase, which should make yield go down, right? Yes. Yeah, but with the 1559, all we need is some bull market activity and we'll yeah. be burning it all and the yield goes up, right? Because wow. the transaction fee does, like the, the tips that used to go to miners now go mm -hmm. to the stakers, oh. right? So right. it's directly dependent on network activity as well. Mm, so okay. In a so new bull even, market, yes, yeah. we could so see like double digit yields again. That's interesting. Okay, so it doesn't, even if there's more staked ETH, if there's also more activity on Ethereum that, that could drive yields higher. Yep. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, let's move to next topic. Um, <clears throat> Barnbridge, uh, 
we we almost had a, a week with no new SEC action, uh, but no, didn't <laughs> we, we didn't get that. Uh, and um, apparently, Barnbridge, uh, a DeFi protocol, is being investigated by the SEC. Uh, I don't think we have the actual investigation. We just have a post from uh, a Barnbridge team member saying that they're being investigated, and so they are winding down operations. Um, this is super interesting because the SEC has uh, done obviously huge uh, actions against major centralized exchanges, but we haven't really uh, seen uh, much uh, in enforcement around DeFi uh, from the SEC. Uh, so this would be one of the, the, the few uh, cases where, where they are uh, coming after DeFi. Um, so I think, I don't know, we'll have to kind of wait and see, if, uh, before we get more details on why they're being investigated and uh, like what the outcome of this investigation will be. Um, but I think, you know, this is, uh, an interesting signal that the SEC is in fact looking at, at DeFi and not just the major uh, projects, but pretty small ones like Barnbridge is, is not one of the biggest uh, DeFi protocols out there. I think it just... You know, our story says TVL is just 1.3 million. Um, so pretty noteworthy that the SEC is looking at just like the smaller DeFi projects um, out there. I mean, there's some speculation, not saying that, you know, Barnbridge is doing this, but mm -hmm. until there's proof of a complaint, this seems like a very convenient way to, I don't know, you know, wind down, walk away with the treasury and say, you know, the SEC is after me. So. Again, I mean, not yeah. speculating, but some people That's, are. So, some people are saying that. So yeah, we'll have to wait until we see the actual uh, in investigation. Mm. Um, okay, and then let's move over to uh, hacks, which we had a couple uh, this, this week. Jeremy, you want to take this? It wouldn't be crypto without hacks, of course. Gentlemen, I mean, right? <laughs> and, uh, we've had some pretty big ones. Unfortunately, yeah. these bridges lead into troubled waters, not over them. Uh, Multi-chain was drained for, I think, about $120 million and counting or more, um, about $123 million exactly, uh, to be more precise. Um, now, this is a cross-chain protocol that operates across a dozen different blockchains, and they, they were in the news in the beginning of June because their CEO went absent and some servers uh, went offline. They had to cut services for a bunch of the chains that were attached to it. Um, in this case, the hack took place shortly after a report from, um, what was it? Um, a report that another organization, what was it? I'm sorry about this. Okay. They had some support from, a, they had some support for a number of uh, wrap tokens uh, on the phantom layer. Unfortunately, uh, it became clear that there was some kind of issue with multi-chain. It wasn't exactly clear what it was at the beginning. A number of protocols, as a result of the lack of news from multi-chain, said, "Hey, we're going to burn our tokens." Like uh, Popsicle burned their ICE tokens. They said, "We're going to we're going to launch uh, an airdrop to make a uh, make people write on that with the Wagme token." More details on that are going to come out later on. And the the real issue here is that when these bridges go down, the assets that are used as collateral, uh, if they get drained, the assets that are on the bridge are basically worthless. And then mm -hmm. so we saw that happen here. Another situation happened. A different hack took place on, uh, you know, in in to compound the news earlier this week on July third, my birthday. Um, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't a happy birthday for the Poly Network because it got hacked. And so again, this is like Poly Network. I think it's been breached before. Uh, I think one of the second largest hacks on record in DeFi. Well, this time around $10 million of Binance, USD, BNB tokens, 100 trillion SHIB tokens were minted on these chains that didn't have a lot of deep liquidity. So while a lot of tokens were minted, the hacker was only able to get away with around $10 million, around $5,000 uh, ETH, 5,000 ETH. Only around 10 million of the potential, what, 200 that they, they, they printed tokens of. But if you think about that, that's ten million dollars that this guy just walked away with, and or this individual just walked away with, and and it leads us back down this road of these insecure bridges are probably not the place for a lot of assets to to 
to reside if we don't have secure secure protocols that are robust enough to manage these types of exploits and and it's unfortunate to see that it happens time and time again almost every single week we see another large exploit um now ethereum developers are working to kind of maybe introduce a protocol to mitigate some of these exploits um and that's in the form of this circuit breaker if you will it's called a eip 7265 and what it would do is it would allow developers to put some kind of boundaries on uh, withdrawal limitations it's drawn some scrutiny because there's this kind of sentiment on Ethereum that we already have some sort of centralization forming. Uh, we've seen that Flashbots and MEV Boost, are, most of the blocks that are formed on Ethereum go through these protocols that are designed to allow validators to extract the maximum value by arranging blocks in a certain way. Um, having a protocol level um, implementation that would allow developers to bottleneck how much funds you're taking out might not be a great look for a decentralized protocol. Now, in order to mitigate those effects on the user, they've said that if someone like a developer wants to change those limitations, the user would be able to, prior to that limitation change being implemented, withdraw their funds. So there's kind of like a stopgap measure for that, but it's still somewhat, you know, again, we're talking about a decentralized protocol and these types of limitations would seem to be something that a centralized protocol would implement. Um, and that's why they're talking about putting fail safes into it. Um, it's kind of a controversial thing, you know, uh, mm. over the past year since before and after, I think Shanghai, we were seeing a lot of these, um, MEV protocols coming into, uh, prevalence and due to the fact that we have a relatively centralized number of staking protocols, for instance, I think you can look at the five top staking protocols have a majority of staked ether on Ethereum, right? And and those are like Lido and then followed up by the exchanges, you know? So as a result of that, there is a very large sentiment in the blockchain community looking on Ethereum that it is sort of moving towards the centralization. And I am not sure what developers can do to, to, to mitigate that. It's very clear that the network needs to be efficient. It needs to be scalable and it needs to be secure. So somewhere within that tri triforce, if you will, of uh, those three factors, we have to find uh, we have to find some sort of uh, balance. But do you think that this um, this EIP, uh, which provides this uh, stopgap from users withdrawing uh, uh, over some uh, some threshold, do you think that's uh, increases centralization or I mean in what in what way does it uh, increase centralization or is it just about having ethereum become less permissionless because it's it's kind of I dictating think it's, like how to use the protocol so I think it's the semblance that any one developer can in, initiate some sort of limitation and therefore you have like this person this protocol this entity stating what you can do in a system that was designed to not impose right. limitations like that. And so mm -hmm. that is the sentiment that kind of gives it this idea of centralization in and amongst the decentralized ecosystem. Furthermore, when we're talking about permission systems, like permission and permissionless, basically open blockchain or closed blockchain networks really has more to do with the entities that are spinning these things up. So like you've got a permission blockchain that might be great for like a central entity anyway. So we're, we're talking about in that instance, these types of limitations might make perfect sense there, but mm -hmm. centralized or, or permissioned blockchains are built for entities that are not operating necessarily in the public. They're operating within a number of chosen selected peers, right? So when we are selecting the peers that we operate with, it becomes less important to the onlookers or the community or the ecosystem that we're dealing with for there to be rules that are decentralized. Everyone's playing by the same rules. Now, when we expand that out to a market like the Ethereum marketplace with tons of participants, this thing was built to be a virtual machine with all these individuals transacting, using it as, as, a, as a, a, a transactive layer, but also a computational layer, that becomes more complicated. Yeah, yeah, it is controversial. Um, but but again, like, like you said, it does 
uh, on, on the other hand, make Ethereum safer, right? It, it provides this uh, stopgap uh, for, for users, um, which, you know, we, we do want it to be safer for if, if we want Ethereum to and blockchain technology to become mainstream, like you, you want those stopgaps. I mean, it's similar to what credit cards um, and debit cards uh, uh, have, right? Like there, there, there is kind of a, a limit to how much you can withdraw to um, avoid, you know, somebody stealing all your money if they get a hold of your card. Uh, so this is this would be kind of a similar uh, idea. I think um, the, yeah. the bottom line with this one is it keeps it's a safeguard against exploiters from like from outside, mm. but it doesn't protect you from a malicious dev mm. because he could trigger the function and you your funds are stuck indefinitely until they decide to release you. Mm. And that's why they're talking about initiating like a time a table mm. for that devs. Like if a dev does initiate some type of malicious change, uh, you would be given the opportunity to. Re- you can move your funds from that protocol prior to that change uh, being implemented. And and that's very important. Yeah, uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, time marks were all the rage back in DeFi summer, right? Every new yeah. farm that came in, that's the first thing you check. Oh, is do they do they have a time lock or oh, a yeah. time apen? So, yeah. yeah. And back uh, to Cami's point, like Ethereum's necessity to uh, exhibit this security, we're reminded of it on a daily or weekly basis with these hacks. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, moving on to a uh, compound. Owen, why was Comp Token rallying so much recently? Uh, s- still somewhat mysterious. We mm-hmm. ha- the biggest news around Compound in the last week or so was that Robert Leshner, who was a founding member of the protocol and Compound Labs, which is the company which stewarded Compound, he stepped down to start a new. Uh, mutual fund uh, called Superstate, which will have an optional uh, blockchain component to it. And um, so he stepped down and surprisingly, we saw comp uh, more than double over the past two weeks uh, during which he made his move. And Compound Labs has a new uh, CEO named Jason Hobby. And so there was some rippling of maybe super state people comp holders will get some kind of kickoff from super state, but that, that seems pretty unfounded at this point. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's not entirely clear why. Yeah. Compound had crazy price action. I mean, we've also seen other major DeFi protocol tokens have great weeks. So there might've been, uh, you know, I guess compounding factors, if you will, Mm -hmm. Um, between, between them, you know, we saw Uniswap up, um, I think, or Ave up thirty one percent, Maker up. Um, uh, yeah, I think. Sorry, I'm just reading my chart here. Um, yeah, it looks like Maker was up twenty twenty one percent, Ave was up thirty one percent in the past couple weeks. So, but high level mystery. There was also a huge buyer of comp tokens, which we saw on chain. I think they they bought maybe like ten million of comp in total, which actually isn't that far below the, the total. I think, I'm not sure what the compound market supply is, but um, so it, it may be that one, that one player obviously had some, some serious impact on the price. I don't know to what degree that was, but. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't been tracking comp liquidity recently, but 10 mil might've pumped it all by himself, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Might That's be enough. a lot for a, even a big governance token. Yeah. Yeah, and that was like six six days ago. I think one of the biggest transactions went through, so mm-hmm. that likely had a had a had a fair bit to do with it. Interesting to see just uh, so much activity um, uh, around comp, uh, which has been a bit quiet. I think uh, yeah. recently, like they they were such a big player early on, um, yeah. but they 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 have lagged a bit uh, relative to. Uh, Ave and Maker and like other like OG DeFi uh, protocols. So uh, now that they have a new CEO, maybe I don't know. Uh, we'll see uh, other uh, different kind of strategies uh, come from from them. Yeah. Um, I think Ave yeah. is one to watch, yeah. especially with the stablecoin expected to come out soon. Yep. Because uh, you know fees for staked Ave should uh, uh, start picking up. I mean it's been pretty dormant for a while 
but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah just just going back the compound the new ceo has a designer background so it'll be interesting i think oh. people that, you don't usually don't see that happen so yeah. interesting that he's coming up so interesting yeah, we'll see yeah, yeah, and we'll see if, if DeFi tokens start uh, gaining steam if, if this trend continues here. Um, they, they usually lag ETH, uh, yeah. as we've reported uh, before. Um, but, you know, like, like we covered uh, in this, you know, in, in, in the recap, there, there seems to be just a, a innovation and, and activity around DeFi with LSTFi. Um, and, you know, uh, Pendle and uh, all these, you know, just, uh, you know, more development happening um, in a space that, that had been a little bit uh, dormant. So we will see if, if this time around DeFi tokens uh, outperform ETH uh, or not. Um, but, okay, moving on to uh, uh, Bitcoin um development uh what the uh, jeremy do you want to take this one yeah so we've seen the kind of uh, cropping up of an interesting thing on the bitcoin ecosystem something that was happening with ethereum was kind of reimagined on bitcoin its ordinals uh, this is uh something that takes some information in bitcoin transactions and then puts it directly onto the blockchain, that information could be a video, it could be um, it could be music, it could be a JPEG or an image like that. This information, rather than it being a token, such as like a, an ERC-20 token or uh, like an Ethereum token, uh, a non-fungible token, it's literally transaction data that's right on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, um, Luminex is a launch pad for these Bitcoin ordinals. And what they've done is they've released a version of the BRC20 token standard, which, by the way, to kind of give you a little background on that, BRC20 tokens are Bitcoin ordinal tokens that mimic some properties of ERC20 tokens, making them tr somewhat tradable. All right. Um, they have said that they have found a protocol. It's called the BRC69 protocol. And basically what this does is it takes the ability to call back data from the Bitcoin blockchain, like those little bits of data that each one of those JPEGs is, they have a recursive callback uh, tool that basically allows you to take the information that's residing on that blockchain, call it back in a certain order. And by doing so, it reduces the cost of deploying things by something like 90%. Now, recursive callbacks um, are a very interesting you know, feature in programmability. Uh, so, you know, having stuff that's permanently stored on a blockchain or a Bitcoin blockchain for that instance, for instance, uh, the idea that you have these data points that you can permanently refer to with callbacks, it's kind of an interesting situation. BRC tokens right now, I think at the time of writing, uh, we had a somewhat of a $262 million market cap on them. Now it's down from a billion dollars in May. Uh, when these things took off, they were just the, the hottest thing that you could get your hands on. Mm -hmm. And now they've kind of tapered off a little bit. So we've seen kind of the waning interest in that. Um, perhaps the BRC69 token standard will revitalize some of that marketplace because they've lowered the costs for deployment. Uh, we shall see. Super interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, speaking about just new development in, in DeFi, it's been it's been really cool to see this happening on Bitcoin too, and not just Ethereum and other uh, layer ones. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, uh, and then to to wrap up, um, Owen, uh, what's going on with uh, gas on Ethereum and this VMPX uh, token? Sure. So, uh, as as you might have seen, gas was really high over the past couple of days. That was because I, there was a I believe it was an eight hour mint of a token called VMPX, which is going to be used as a bridge token between, <coughs> you saw, <coughs> excuse me, Blue Bum loves uh, VMPX. Nice. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, so, so it, I, I talked to Jack Levin, who's part of the Zen ecosystem of which VMPX is a part. VMPX is supposedly going to be the bridge token, whereby if you want to go from Bitcoin to Ethereum, you know, you, you're going to be able to trade some token on, on Bitcoin into VMPX, port that over the bridge, and then you'll have VMPX on Ethereum and they'll trade into the token. And so basically, um, 
it, it's interesting because you know this guy has a huge following. He has like half a million followers on Twitter, and it, and and I mean, what I find most fascinating about all this is that Zen, and it's part of this whole Zen ecosystem, which which was what made ETH deflationary for the first time last October, and also mm-hmm. spiked gas insanely in April as they have these new derivative projects spouting off. And it's just, it's very crazy that there's this project, which like no one in the core DeFi realm seems to know about, but occasionally just like absolutely dominates gas out of nowhere. And it's, and weird. it's so weird, you know? And, and, and so I still don't understand it. And I'm trying to like contextualize it in my mind. And it like, and I, I don't know, it, it's fascinating because they don't have VC backing. The way Zen works is you can just go mint it and you just pay gas fees and there's kind of a decay function so in eight years it's going to be really hard to acquire right now you can acquire it for cheap but there's no vcs there's no pre-mine so in part of it it feels very like of the people but part of me just feels very skeptical because i'm like who are these guys and you know um who is this like lionized founder figure um Mm. so yeah it's very fascinating some people don't seem to care i i think it's interesting but um yeah it's just it just seems like every couple months now we're seeing some Zen related project absolutely dominate Ethereum gas and, and people don't really talk about it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's like you see these, uh, these projects just top the charts, like even above Uniswap. Um, and I think, you know, for, for us, like watching the space day to day, it's almost like you dismiss it because it's yeah. like, Oh, this weird thing. It doesn't yeah. count, but it, it actually does. Like it's real money being spent. Yeah. Yeah. He said they burned, I think it was 90 million uh, in in ETH total since uh, I think since EIP 1559. Um, yeah. So yeah, worth watching. And, and yep. he made another point. Just sorry, last one about this. I know it's been a super long podcast, but like um, just that, that I did notice tweeted about this, that yeah, sending receiving addresses for the Zen token, it's like the top token on Polygon, on second highest on BNB, top on Avalanche's C chain, and top on Phantom. And it's and it's like, what what is this thing? So, anyways, I'm I'm curious to see where this goes, if anywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Jack Levin, if you're listening, maybe you can come on the stream um, and, and explain what what all of this is about. Yeah. Okay, I think we should be wrapping up. Um, we've gone way over uh, the hour. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. Um, and, yeah, wish you all a, a, a great uh, weekend. Um, and join us next week for another recap. Bye, all everyone. Right. See you guys. Thanks for being